Hello and welcome to Springboard, your virtual university. My name is Albert Okran. Welcoming you on behalf of Team Springboard, led by Comfort. This is your most inspirational show and the point where the greatest minds in the world converge. Your virtual university is brought to you by the Springboard Roadshow Foundation in partnership with the Multimedia Group and proudly sponsored by MTN Pulse, the enterprise group UMB Bank, with support from the graphic business. And so make a date on Tuesday in the graphic business on page 18 for a full transcript of this interview we are about to have. If you haven't done so, so far, check out my YouTube channel, Albert Okran, for back editions of our discussions in the engine room. Very interesting behind the scenes con conversations with frontliners in various fields, ministry, corporate, and every area in between. Entertainment, media, finding out the parts of their story you would not find in any publication or in any other interview. My guest for today is a leader, a mentor, and a role model to several people across the globe. Dr. Yaupebi is a physician, a pastor, and president of the International Student Ministries in Canada, a ministry with some 100 staff and 500 volunteers spread from coast to coast in that great country. He is the founder and CEO of Global CEO of the Hard Group and a big friend and partner with us here at Springboard. Dr. Yao, good to see you. Good to see you too. How are you? Very well, by God's grace. Very well. It's well, good to be in Accra. I was going to say, welcome back home because, <laughs> because we, 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 we touch base and we just hear what you are doing across the world, and mm. particularly in Canada. Yes. And it's always good to have you here in Ghana. We are honored to have you here with us at Springboard. It's good to be here. Thanks for the invitation. I don't take it for granted. It's a blessing. How's the past year and a half been? It's been a quite a traumatic and at the same time revealing experience for the whole world. How has it been for you for ministry and your work? Very good question. Uh, there's no one who has not been affected in one way or the other by, by this pandemic, um, in good ways and also in, 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 in bad ways. And uh, initially, uh, in fact, I was in Ghana last year with you mm -hmm. at the Africa Leadership uh, Initiative program we did, the Aliwa program. We had all this fun <laughs> in March. I it was just, 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 before just before the world went crazy. You know, so I left Ghana, uh, I forget the date, in March, and the next week everything was closed and my family was stuck here. You know, uh, so for those of you who don't know, I have seven children. And uh, so three of them were in Ghana with me and my wife, the three youngest. And so they were trapped here in Ghana. You know. And so for about three, four months, the family was apart because all borders closed, airports closed, all of that. And so I was in Canada with the older three, and Angeli was in Ghana with the younger three. It was a kind of split. <laughs> it was split. We were doing family by Wi-Fi. Wow. <laughs> and then, by God's grace, the Canadian government organized a repatriation flight just out of the blue, and they were able to to fly from Accra straight to Toronto. So I also drove six hours from Montreal to Toronto to go and pick them up. Uh, so so it was a very happy day in your life. It was a very happy day. It was a very happy day. Um, apart from that, you know, we've had close friends and ministry partners, etc., who have been affected. You know, some have passed away. I mean, they rest in peace. Uh, but <clears throat> it was interesting in terms of, so all I do has to do leadership development, whether it's on the campus, whether it's in churches, whether it's in the corporate space, leadership, leadership, leadership. So it was interesting to see how all campuses closed. You know, so all these international students, and Canada has almost 600,000 international students from 200 countries, and all of a sudden there was nothing happening on the campuses. So it was interesting that, you know, ministry, training, all of that had to pivot online, you know. So it's interesting because although that was supposed to be a negative thing, it also became a positive thing because all of a sudden we had more reach you know, and some students who have been training as leaders who have returned to places like China and India, you know, Vietnam, name it, who we couldn't physically see, all of a sudden, all began to appear online, you know. So that has been a good thing, the increase of our reach. It's been ministry and training, leadership development without borders. That has been the upside of it. In fact, one of the companies we run, um, 
called Pebicaps uh, Library Services, uh, started, you know, as physical books. You know, so we had just come in March. That's how come my wife and I were here in March. You know, I had just come to implement something in Accra, with Accra Richard School, which is my alma mater. You know, and then this COVID-19 thing hit. So everything ceased because you couldn't give our physical books, all of that. But what happened was that we pivoted online. And that has totally changed the trajectory of this thing. So from a few hundred students in one school, actually there were three schools involved, now we have about 2,000 children from 200 schools and some are not even in Accra. You know, so I'm, basically what I'm saying is they have been downsized to this pandemic, but like everything, like at COIN, there's also been upsides to it. The first time I heard somebody say COVID has been a blessing, yeah. I looked around to see whether there was anybody else there. <laughs> because it sounded almost like did they call right. it an oxymoron. Or, yes, it sounded, yes. the, the two things could not co coexist side That's by right. side. That's right. COVID and blessing. Yes. But he was very honest in telling mm. me how, after the initial shock, That's right. he explored new ways of doing things That's right. and reaped the reward. That's right. And I sat back later and I said, you know what? Yeah. If you took time to begin to ask, you mm. will find out that it's not an isolated story. And so That's since right. then, I've spoken to several people and even looked at our own reach mm. and mm. come to the conclusion that whereas mm. there is also the trauma of, there's of a lot COVID, to mourn, but invariably you will yes. find that there's also the reach, the expansion, the opportunity. That's right. And talking about ministry, I was talking That's to right. Scripture Union mm. on my birthday. I did a thank you SU campaign okay. just to say. SU has been a blessing to all of us. That's you were right. in SU. Absolutely. Uh, uh, yes. all Even my of parents SU. came to faith through absolutely. SU. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And so I did a thank you SU mm. campaign for my birthday, raising funds for them, creating awareness mm. for them. We did t-shirts. We That's did a awesome. walk, 27 kilometer walk, wow. just focusing on SU. Awesome. And I sat with the leadership of SU and they were talking about the fact that because of COVID, mm. the schools do not have physical SU meetings. Oh. And I was thinking, what is SU without meeting? That's right. <laughs> so they've had to also pivot online. So okay. this pivoting you're talking about is yes. real. It's really almost like the only way to go. Yeah. And you are saying it's created leadership without borders. Leadership without borders, impact without borders, ministries without borders, you know, business without borders. Mm -hmm. As I speak, you know, I have an executive ex executive education company I run doing executive coaching, you know, leadership training, development, stuff like that in the corporate space. And my operations person is in Uganda. My executive assistant is in Kenya. You know, my marketing team is in Ghana, you know, and it doesn't matter because every time we meet, it, it's as if we're in the same room, you know. So even for Africa and Pan-Africanism and all of that, this probably has been our greatest opportunity to actually get together. It's, it's, it's been phenomenal. And, and the thing is, like you said, use the right word, an oxymoron or a paradox. The thing is that it has deepened the nature of leadership as paradoxical. Leadership is paradoxical. You have to manage the inner life and the outer life. You have to manage impact and profit. <laughs> you know, you have to. There are a lot of things that seem to be opposite that one has to. And the best leadership is the leadership that has learned to do the dance mm. between this and that. We are in the world, but not of the world. There are all these paradoxes. And that is what COVID-19 has emphasized. So all of a sudden, we need to have local impact, but global outlook, global view, global reach, you know, and it's not going to change because now the best case scenario after this pandemic is that we are going to be hybrids. The people that survive in the world after COVID-19, it's not going to be only online and it's not going to be only in person. It's the people who are amphibians, mm. who are able to live underwater and live on land, live online and live in person, you know, are the ones who are going to thrive. Years ago, I spoke about the ambidextrous mm. anointing. Mm. At the time, it was a sermon about the right hand and the left hand. Wow. And my, my thesis in that message was that the right hand represented God's power, God's grace, okay. um, the, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, mm. the strength that comes from above. Mm. And the left hand represented skill. Mm ability, discipline, mm. all the attributes that one needs to bring to the table That's to right. combine with the grace of God to That's achieve right. success. That's right. And when you talked about hybrid, mm. my mind went back to that mm. ambidextrous anointing. I have a feeling that what you're saying is mm. that the world post-COVID right. would have a hybrid of people who can do 
in-person stuff. That's right. But who also have the dexterity to deliver online. Absolutely. What happens to those who do not achieve this hybrid that you mentioned? What would happen? Well, with every generation, there something happens that causes a shift, right? And guess what? People are left behind who are not able to make that adjustment. The only reason why we are called third world is because at a particular time in history when there were some shifts, basically industrialization, the industrial revolution, we were left behind and we were classified as third in the class. And we've had the name since then, <laughs> even though the world has changed a lot, you know. But now with the post-COVID world, who knows? Th this may actually be our opportunity to take a leap. Because look at when it comes to telephony, for example, you know, Africa has a, one of the highest phone telephony penetration, mobile phone telephony penetration in the world, you know. And so we've leapfrogged certain stages. We've had, we haven't had to lay down cable lines, you know, like you know, others have done in Europe, etc. We've leapfrogged that. So who knows? I, I, the Americans, and I live in Canada, are now talking about mobile money. Ho! Oh, I'm like, come and see. You know when Kenya started this with the Empire, Momo and all that? We are way miles ahead when it comes to things like that. So who knows? Maybe, maybe the digital revolution, that may be our opportunity. Actually, Dr. Dr. Tabel has preached this in various fora mm. as forcefully, mm. forcibly, mm. and emphatically as he can, mm. saying that this could just be this Africa's could be the level of call. And... If I may take one theme out of the last Greater West Conference, mm. it is the fact that this, these developments that the world is going through right now mm. actually could be Africa's season yeah. to leapfrog by yeah. a combination of forces and our own readiness Absolutely. to put ourselves at the forefront. Absolutely. But, and, and by the way, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the church space, in the you know, ministry space and all of that, this is also the season where Africa all of a sudden has more Christians than any other continent. Mm. Since 2018, Africa has had more Christians, 30 million more than Latin America, which is number two, and Europe is number three. This is a record that has been held by Europe for the last 1,000 years, Albert. 1,000 years. And in our lifetime, on our watch, we see this gargantuan seismic shift happening. You know, so just I'm just agree with you. Just like saying, there, there are a number of factors that are that are just coming together for such a time as this. And I pray that we will we will capi diem. We will seize the moment, and who knows what will come out of it. These conversations sound strange, mm. and because today I, I tell people that when you when they say Martin Luther King said this, mm. or Gandhi said this, or mm. Mother Teresa said this. We often think that it's because they made an announcement. I'm, I'm about to give a quote. <laughs> a quote. That's right. That's and right. said it. No, yeah, it yeah, probably was yeah. ordinary conversations right. like that's right. this. That's right. And they made profound statements that's that right. history lent credence Absolutely. to. Absolutely. And some of these calls that are being made about the yeah. future of Africa and yeah. this being our potential yeah. turning point that's right. could end up being affirmed by history and time. That's right. So I see these moments as very profound Profound and prophetic. In our history, yes, yes. I like the word prophetic. Yes. Doctor, let me take you back sure. to your beginnings. Yes. I mean, if I look at your life now, if I, I don't seek your permission and I wanted to, to describe you with one word, okay. it would be very easy. Okay. Leadership. Yes. That's yeah, you. You're, as you're long true. as I've known you you're throughout true. your That's life. True. You're right. It's been leadership. You're right. Let me take you back to your beginnings. Yes. Growing up, did you have a sense that this is how your life would turn out? Yes and no. Yes, because there are always these little indicators. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I was almost not born. I don't know whether you, don't know, you know that. Actually, almost not born alive. Because all of a sudden, um, at birth, it was realized I, had, I was coming with what is called a face presentation. Mm. And I was just basically knocking my face against my mother's pelvis. Sorry, you know. sorry. Uh, yes, I, you know, eventually when I came out by cesarean, I hear I was all red. But I like to joke about it to say that I, I couldn't wait to come and make a difference in the world. I was like, yeah, I'm coming, I'm coming. You know, but in that moment, my mom in the, in the don't forget this is in the 70s, and technology, medicine, all of that hadn't advanced the way it is like, like now in Ghana. So all of a sudden, this woman has to do a cesarean. 
you know, so in the fright and concern, etc., she said to God, and don't forget her, uh, her, her mother had lost her first child. She said, God, if you give me this child, if you spare this child's life, I will give him back to you. Is that not familiar? Very familiar story of Samuel. So right from birth, that, that tendency was there. I was the first, you know, so naturally leading my siblings, so to speak. It's funny, I went to Richard's school, which was, at that time, you had to pass an interview at class six. Can you imagine? Go for it. You were registered at birth. <laughs> you know, and all of that. Basically, but I went to Richard, all my siblings followed to Richard. I went to Achimoto school, all my siblings followed to Achimoto school. I went to University of Ghana, all my siblings followed. So, in the family, there was that. There was that obvious leadership thing. But then in Sunday school, there was this. There were signs here and there so that when we had a play to do, for example, I would be just Jesus in the play. My first time of being on TV was, you know, we used to be part of Behe Methodist Church and the Sunday school was invited. It used to be this children's program on Sunday. Mm -hmm. What did they call it? You know, and we were on and guess what? I was Jesus. You know, so when there's a children's fundraiser, you know, I... Oh, yeah, we'll be the chairperson, that kind of thing. So the signs were there, you know, class prefect or class cupboard boy, you know, all of that. Then by junior high, I became, you know, deputy senior prefect, you know, in, in, in Achimoto School, I was prefect as well. So the signs have always been there. But it had to, yeah, I mean, university too, you know, president of Christian Medical Fellowship. I was the first class president of our class, you know, and it was a very interesting time because I had to make the decision whether or not our year group was going to medical school because there was an aluta on campus and, and nobody wanted to sign a paper to say you guys can leadership well class of 2004 you know so it has always been there and as i was reflecting you know this morning before coming here when you look at my life you think this guy is scattered right he's like oh he's a doctor you know so there's medicine i've been in the military you know united nations it's like I'm in education, finance. It's like, he's a pastor, <laughs> he's a visionary. But what seems scattered when you look through all of it, the thread, the common thread is leadership. And so, yes, you, you've made a very, very profound observation. And every one of these spaces, from military to media, medicine to mission, it has been leadership. Um, a certain kind of leadership, though, I have been a great proponent of authentic leadership. And I think, and now that is a big thing in the corporate space, especially after the dot com bubble burst and 9 11 and Enron, Arthur Anderson, all of that. It's a big deal now. And not just fake it till you make it kind of thing, not just, you know, and especially with social media, there's a tendency for people to blow the image, but image reputation and character sometimes are misaligned. So authentic leadership is a big deal. And cross-cultural or intercultural leadership. Um, it's, it's, so I think that right now my clarion call is authentic leadership. Guys, let's be authentic. Even on this show, I like Engine Room because we're talking about things that are real, hard things, difficult things, all of that, but what makes leadership real, not just what you see on the stage, on TV, uh, but also intercultural leadership. Because this generation, like we just talked about COVID, the world has shrunk in that way. And anybody who does not grow in their intercultural competency will not make it. Because right now, you've, you have to deal with China. You can't bypass India. The US is still in the mix. You know, but how do you, how do you live in the world that is like that? You know, I just had a conversation with one of my coaching clients. She's one of the top uh, CEOs in Kenya. You know, and she's looking at rebranding, etc. And I'm looking at one of the companies in Ghana that I work with, connecting him to Kenya. He's got to be able to at least say Habari, Jumbo, you know, and be able to cross culture, you know, that way. That way. So that that is that is an essential part of leadership development. The fact that it's a global world, and everyone's got to increase their GQ. There's a lot of talk about IQ, EQ, emotional intelligence, but global intelligence. It's, 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 it's currency. Let me stay with this global intelligence and, and, and explore what prepared you mm. For, mm. for GQ. Let me rewind. You yes. mentioned your work in medicine, mm. in the army, mm. in finance, mm. in ministry, <laughs> in media. Mm. For the benefit of those who are not 
your Pebby fans or who have okay. not followed your story. Yes. Just for the person who's logged on today or tuned into the virtual university and the engine room, yes. either for the first time or has not been around this space for quite a while, mm. give us an idea about the trend. So, the, okay. you went to medical school. Yes. Yes. And then what? So, just before that, even before medical school, from Achimota, I had the opportunity to be to go on an exchange program, you know, to the US. You know, after pre line science and math quiz and all of that and uh, present beat us in the final. But anyway, um, so that exchange program was a good opener to the global world, you know, things like that. Then the next year I was a World Vision Youth Ambassador. I remember that so well. It was a life changing thing. Fifty young people from fifty different countries, Albert. That was the, 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 the that was a point where I I, I took note of you ah, that, that year. It was, it was a big thing. That changed everything. All of a sudden, the news made sense when there was a bombing in Lebanon. I think of, you know, uh, uh, one of my friends from Lebanon, you know, when, when there's a, something in Sri Lanka. So that really opened my mind, opened the space. Which country did you go to for that? So we were in Taiwan mainly um, for about, uh, about a month and a half, but then we toured. Uh, the U.S. from East Coast, from you know New York, and you know, and on Good Morning America, all of that. New York, Washington D.C. Then went down to Mexico, you know, and then came back up to the West Coast, uh, Los Angeles, um, Seattle, Washington. And then we went into Canada, you know, uh, as well. So young, eighteen-year-old, with the world open before you, you know, I like to say that my heart expanded and has never been able to shrink since then. Imagine. It just cannot shrink, you know, since then. But this love for the global stuff and everything was actually, you know, growing up, I could tell I had a thing for the world. You know, one of the ways I thought I, would, I wanted to be a pilot. And I, I, I thought it was about the planes. But now I look back and I realize it was about the world. Because I was fascinated with maps and the globe. And I had a grandfather, and which is important in leadership, don't undermine your heritage. It's part of who you are. You see a wolf to a siesua, on che ting ting ye. If you're born a part, you're planted on a mound, it doesn't take long for you to look tall or seem tall. You know, so my grandfather used to fascinate me. So in fact, my sister and I in for primary the, school. For the benefit of. Yes. Regulars <laughs> in the virtual university. You're talking about okay, I'm professor, making a lot of assumptions there. Professor. Professor Emeritus J.H. Yeah. who, That's who right. is celebrated as a legend of our yes. time while yes. he was alive on That's this true. You Big have, celebration. You have foresight. Yes. You still do have a lot of foresight. <laughs> yes, uh, that's right. So even in primary school, class one and two, I remember once we wrote to him to give us a list of all the countries he's been to. And he took his time to type, you know, this is the early 80s, all the countries and how there was a particular day, a particular time he traveled around the world, literally. Because if we went from Ghana to a meeting here, you know, in Japan and then from, you know, that kind of... So there was this fascination, you know, but World Vision Youth Ambassadors really opened that up. So, started Legon after that. Now, 96 was that, World Vision Youth Ambassadors, 97. So, I was invited to come back as a staff intern for this World Vision Youth Ambassadors. That was the first time that happened. That was the second time it had, it had happened, yes, the second time. So, myself and the girl from Colombia. But again, Albert, what that did for me was this. Huh, I'm not just a village champion. I'm just, just, just good for Ghana. I'm good for the world. And I could hear comments like my roommate was from Indonesia in 96, and he said, you have changed my perception of Africans. When we had meetings, sometimes I'll be quiet when we had to make decisions, and people would say, we cannot end the meeting without hearing from you. So this leadership you're talking about, I began to see the cross-cultural, the global elements of it, even as young as 18 invited back among 50 all talented people invited back in 97 wow but all this while my passion was yes let's show ghana to the world and i did not want have any interest in living outside the country in fact i had to tell if there was one world vision staff who really wanted to convince me said you know america needs talents like you and I said to him, Africa needs me more. You know, that kind of thing. So, you know, Yanko Baby, I was staying in Ghana, I want to make it here, etc. you know. So yeah, came back, did medicine. So I did medical school, finished practice at 37. And then that's how come I was asked to go on the United Nations peacekeeping to 
Côte d'Ivoire. But this is the thing. When I got married in 2006, I went for a younger leaders gathering, a Lausanne younger leaders gathering. And Lausanne is something, Lausanne movement is something Billy Graham started in 1974. He brought together about 2,000 you know, Christian leaders to talk about the Great Commission in Lausanne, Switzerland. So since then, it's been known as the Lausanne movement. And they've organized a few younger leaders gatherings. So 2006 was one of them. I was sitting in Malaysia and I heard the Lord speak very clearly to me. Albert, he said, it's my world. And I send you where I want you. So, hey. Then the beginning of 2008, Anjali, my wife and I were reading the scriptures when Genesis 12, 1 literally jumped off the pages. Leave your country, your people, your father's household, and go to a land I will show you. And, and just to give you an idea, and our audience an idea, how much we were not, we had no plans to live outside the country. We were like, Ghana, dear, I want to live here, make it here. And Yulis actually born Canadian. She was born when her dad was doing his PhD at McMaster in Ontario, in Canada. He came back to Ghana when she was two years old. A Ghanaian with a Canadian passport never stepped again in Canada until 2008, that year when God said, go. So God says this in January. By June, I find myself kicked out from Ghana to Cote d'Ivoire to work with the United Nations because with our peacekeeping troops, you know, in Boaké, the rebel stronghold in the middle of the country. By June, July, and Yule gets kicked out to do her master's in economics at McGill University. Why do you say kicked out? Because we went, we went screaming, screaming and <laughs> kicking, you know, and and and. And, and I met people who said to me, hey, and you're not saying we took wine down, you know, and things like that. And I said, yes, you know, but we, we are under the orders, the commands of a certain God, and we do what he says we should do. And I say this because, so one year, cross-cultural work in Cote d'Ivoire, then I joined Anjali in, in, in Canada because she got into a PhD, and I, you know, it's another story. But then soon, we had begun training Canadians. Sometimes we'll drive nine hours to places where they didn't have pastors and do pastors training and do leaders training. I said, the, the, the black African is training Canadians. Soon, I'll be pastoring a Chinese church. I, <laughs> for four years, so I used to tell people, only God can call an African to pastor an English-speaking Chinese church in a French city in North America. But I'm sharing this to encourage our audience that we were made for the world. Especially if you are a person of the Christian faith, the global life is the normal Christian life because we serve a global God. The global life is the normal Christian life because we serve a global Lord or God. Those are the words of Dr. Yao Pebi. If you held your breath if you joined us halfway through and held your breath asking who is speaking that is the voice of Dr. Yao Pebi the global CEO of the Hard Group and my guest today in the engine room is also the president of the International Student Ministries in Canada that has a hundred staff and 500 volunteers dotted across the country I'll go for a brief break when I come back We'll begin to look at how every little step along the way has prepared him for this and see whether we can use that as a standard to look at your life and possibly how every experience in your life has prepared you for a global world under a global God. This is Springboard Adventure University brought to you by the Springboard Racial Foundation in partnership with the Multimedia Group and proudly sponsored by MTN Pulse, UMB Bank, the Enterprise Group, with support from the Graphic Business. Get page 18 of the Graphic Business this Tuesday, and this interview will be transcribed in full on that page and also on my Joy Online and Graphic Online. Let's go for a break. When we come back, let's get into the piston rings with Dr. Yaupedi. Please don't go away. 
Don't be left out. Download the Pulse app from the App Store or Play Store to mash up all day, every day. You can also enjoy more mashup. Just buy the new Mega Bundle and get 3 gigabytes data, extra 400 megabytes for your social apps, and free MTN to MTN calls every Monday. So go ahead, feel the Pulse on MTN Pulse. Just be we're good together everywhere you go. There once was a man who had it all. He had skill, he had charisma. He was loved by all, but above all, he knew the importance of helping others, lifting others up. He knew the importance of giving other people an advantage so that they too would use that advantage to help others. All you need is that advantage that sets you apart from the rest. And when you discover that advantage, life's challenges don't seem so daunting anymore. That's where we come in. Enterprise, your advantage. UMB was established in 1972 as the premier bank for the corporate and private sector in Ghana. From our very beginning, as the only Ghanaian bank serving all categories of businesses, we set a standard for excellence and innovation over the past 45 years. We've built a financially healthy and strong bank, demonstrated our commitment to our customers and to growing businesses, and exhibited originality and innovation at every turn. At UMB, our focus is built around people, service, products and technology. These are the key to our present success and our future triumphs. At UMB, we are poised to make a difference not only with our customers, but also in the banking industry. We invite you to share in our future. Our future starts now with you. My name is Rashida Sani Nasamo. Keep watching Springboard, your virtual university, with my good friend, Reverend Albert Okran. Welcome back to Springboard, your virtual university, and to the engine room where today I have managed to hijack, kidnap, catch Dr. Yao Pebi. He's been based in Canada for quite a while now, and we've been connecting online, but he happens to be in Ghana, and we are honored to have him here with us as we break down his favorite subject of leadership. And if you've been following the conversation, a few lessons are beginning to emerge. The first one, and probably the biggest one of all, pivoting. He says the world has had to respond to a situation um, created by COVID where things that were done in person now have to be done online, and it provides a unique opportunity to extend our reach and to provide leadership, impact, business, and ministry without borders. Lesson number two is about the new world of work. He says in his executive leadership program, one of his managers is in one country, another one is in another country, and they work together in a seamless way because it's a borderless world that we're living today. And he says, to be able to operate in this world, you must understand the dance of leadership. And you swing in one direction and swing in the other direction, and you are fitting them all together beautifully. The third lesson is about hybrids. I love that one. He says, post-COVID, the best we can get is an amphibian world able to live in water and also on land. That means that the world will not return to totally in-person operation or remain totally online, but there will be a, a requirement of all of us to be able to excel in person and excel online. And as all major shifts in the past, those who can't make that transition will be cut out big time. Lesson number four is our Africa season. And he says COVID-19 could possibly be Africa's greatest opportunity and our season. And if you look at indicators like telephony, mobile money, and a number of other positive indicators, and the fact that we have more Christians than every other continent, all this could positively provide a springboard, my word, to Africa being at the forefront. The fifth is about destiny. He says he was almost not born alive because a medical compli complication meant that you could possibly 
have lost his life at birth. But guess what? His mother prayed and said, Lord, if you will give me this child, he shall be dedicated to you. And it came to pass. Number six is about early pointers. He says, responsibility and leadership were foisted on him right from his childhood. And he ended up being Jesus in the school play, prefect here, prefect there, youth ambassador here, exchange program there. And so it traveled through his, his childhood and his youth. And it has followed him since throughout his life. Number seven is about interwoven threads. He says, if you don't understand the story of his life, it would look like a scattered life with ministry here, business here, um, media here, military here, medicine here, but all those are interwoven parts of his very unique life with the common thread being leadership. And the eighth point is about authentic leadership. He says he has become a proponent of authentic and cross-cultural leadership. And going forward, what is required is GQ, which he calls global intelligent quotient. An ability to understand different cultures, different perspectives, and to work with people. Let's have a debate. Which of these points so far is the one that is, as I say, choking you? It's just freaking you out. Let's have a conversation on social media as we interact with Dr. Yao Pebi. Doc, it's not fair to ask you this question, but which of these points so far is your favorite? <laughs> How unfair. How unfair. How unfair. Yeah. It's just that with the course of the season we are in, I think the COVID-19 related ones are timely. You know, the, these are all timeless principles, I believe. You've done very well to distill them. I think you have a gift there. Thank you. Know, you. Uh, you should open a distillery. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, distillery of thoughts, not of that's alcohol. Right, exactly. How come I haven't thought about that word? Thought yeah. distillery. That's right. Yeah, that's a good one. I, you probably, like, thought leadership was taken, you know, so maybe we Please, can from now right. I, I'm a professor of, I'm a professor of thought distillery. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great, it's a great one. Yes, yeah. that's a great one. Wow. You know, for those who are, who are Christian, the, the, the idea of the amphibian, you know, or the paradoxical, or this and that, should not be lost on us, because that that is the very theology of the incarnation. Mm. There's this Help spirit God. That. There's this God who is in the spiritual realm, and then He becomes flesh. John one, right? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. The Word was God. You know, by fourteen, you know, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. I love Eugene Peterson's translation in the message. He says, "And the Word took on flesh and blood and moved into our neighborhood." You know, so what was spiritual, virtual becomes incarnational, becomes in person. But don't forget, Jesus was fully God and yet fully man. So we should be able to be fully online, be fully excellent at that, and yet be able to be fully in person. I think we have a strong theology for living in this hybrid world. Doc, you bring me to a very sensitive point that is very dear to my heart. Mm. There seems to be a very, very serious dichotomy of thought or very serious differences of opinion mm. on this matter I'm going to ask you about. And I would okay. like to know your own perspective. Sure. And I don't really think there's a right or wrong answer. I'm just curious about yeah. what you think. Okay. So there are people who believe that using a platform to teach people how to work, how to prosper, how to mm. excel mm. is a deviation mm. from the core of the gospel, which should be about salvation mm. of the soul, mm. and especially Christian platforms that find time mm. to express these other engagements yeah. really have departed from the core of the gospel. One school of thought says, it must be the gospel and no Christian platform must spend time teaching people things that mm. relate to their work, mm. leadership, and so on. The other extreme to see is, listen, or the other side to see is, listen, the gospel cannot be full gospel if it does not relate to Absolutely. these other parts of life. Where do you stand on that? Right in the middle. <laughs> Help us to understand. <laughs> no, not exactly in the middle, actually. I, I, I think, not I think, I know because this is a global issue. It's not just a Ghanaian issue. And those of us in the Lausanne movement have been actually dwelling on this. In fact, to the extent that last year, the, you know, the year before the pandemic, 2019, there was a Lausanne Global Workplace Forum. And the CEO of the Lausanne movement, Michael O, oh, a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, actually made a public apology to all those in the marketplace on behalf of people in ministry. 
Help me to understand what he you're saying. He said, we are sorry that we have treated you guys in the marketplace as second-class citizens. We have made it seem as if it's only the spiritual that matters. And that, in fact, you guys are there to support our ministry, bring the time, bring the offerings, etc. No, but that's, that's, the, that's the very opposite of Ephesians 4, where he, he gave us what? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to do what? To prepare the saints for what? The work of the ministry. The work of the ministry is not in the church. <laughs> ministry means service. Why, are the, why do we have minister of information? Minister of, ministry means work. And that is God's work. And so he's, you know what percentage of Christians are, are, are so-called full-time ministers? One percent, globally. One percent. I interviewed, I interviewed the CEO of a hair business mm. who said her work is the work of the Lord. Yes. I interviewed a musician, Kwame That's Eugene, right. yes. who argued that his work He's an evangelist. Absolutely. Are you saying that the people who are doing what you think are secular work have the right to say that they are using their work to serve God? I want to tell everyone here and now that the secular sacred divide is not biblical. Preach. It is not, it is not in the Hebrew text. It's not in the Hebrew mindset. It is not a New Testament teaching either. You know how that's creeped into Christianity? This is, this, 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 this is actually from paganism. You know, when, when, when Christianity was merged with, with politics, with Constantine, Constantine kind of elevated the pastors like the pagans do with the priests. This is Neoplatonism. This is not Christianity. There is no secular, sacred divide. Jesus Christ is Lord of all, or he is not Lord at all. It's all his. In fact, Abraham Cooper, who used to be uh, the, uh, the Dutch prime minister, he started this free university of Amsterdam. Hugh Cooper said that there is no square inch of the entire creation of which Jesus Christ, who is Lord, does not cry, this is mine. Let's start from A to Z. Archaeology, this is mine. Biology, this is mine. Sea chemistry, this is mine. So, and that is part of why, Albert, this country is 70% Christian and we don't feel the impact. Because people live their Christianity in a church building. And as soon as they leave the church building, they let the Bible, they let the values, they let the sermons, everything there. And Monday morning, he's taking a bribe at the ministries. He's crossing a red line by Monday afternoon. But if the policeman understood, that he that keepeth me neither slumbers nor sleep. That when a policeman is doing God's work of security, that when the teacher understands that he's doing God's work of training, of building capacity, building minds, giving skills. When the doctor understands that the great physician is Jesus Christ himself. When the doctor understands that God, Jehovah Rapha, is a healer and that he's doing God's work. Secular work is full-time service. And those of you, and I'm glad I can say this as a doctor and as a pastor, because guess what? God has given that 1% to empower the 99% for his work in the world. Let me tell you what the mission of God is about. God is on a mission to fill the earth with his glory. That has been his mission from day one. And that's why he made human beings in his image and likeness to reflect his image and his likeness. So people spreading on the earth was spreading God's glory because they are image bearers. We are his image bearers. And doesn't matter whether you're Hindu, you're Muslim, whatever, you are an image bearer of God. You bear his image. We may have dropped from that image by, because sin came to spoil the picture in Genesis 3, right? So all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've fallen short, Hamatia. We've fallen short of that glory, that standard. That's why Jesus came, to restore us back to that image, back to that standard. As many as believed in, he gave them power to become sons of God, to reflect God, etc. But that is part of the process to take us back to Eden. You see, so any Christian who, listen, if you miss Genesis 1 and 2, and Revelation 21, 22, you miss the whole show. Two ends. <laughs> you miss the whole show because what we are doing now, Jesus came and right now we are preaching. All of that is towards those book ends to restore what was in Genesis 1 and 2 back. That is the essence of it. So it, it, it's one of the hard things we need to deal with in Africa now because there are 630 million Christians in Africa more than ever before. Like I told you, we are the most Christian content. And I've had to tell my, and there's a book, you know, uh, my a co-author and I are coming up with uh, from East Africa. It's called Africa to the Rest. From Mission Field to Mission Force again. 
And we say again because Africa has even affected Europe in the first century, second century, third century with Christianity before they came back 500 years ago with the gospel. It's not a white man's religion. Anyway, that's another subject. But basically, when we, when we say Africa is the most Christian continent, Albert, we've had to find ourselves almost apologizing by saying, oh, Africa is the most numerically Christian continent in the world now. Why? Because of this secular sacred divide. Our Christianity has not affected our agriculture and has not penetrated our labs. Innovation. Who should be the most innovative people in this country? The people who say they have the spirit of God. So even, even the idea of heaven, people forget that the kingdom, that, that the Jerusalem, the bride, you know, is prepared and comes on earth. People don't know that eternity will be working. So in your mind, that it will be done on earth as it is in heaven is the rule of God being established in business, in, in finance, aspect. in the police station, in the lab, in the innovation hub, everywhere. Absolutely. And that is the mission of God. God, God has it's a threefold mission. Number one, towards himself to bring himself glory from the obedience and worship and knowledge of all peoples, every tribe, nation, tongue. Number two, towards people, towards creation, to bring creation a blessing. So we are blessed to be a blessing. Of course, the greatest blessing is to be a called a friend of God, to have a relation with God. But that is the beginning of a cascade of other blessings, right? And number three is against evil, to vanquish evil and establish his kingdom. And Jesus makes it very clear right from the Lord's Prayer. Hallowed be your name, right? Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. At the end of the prayer, he says what? For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for him. God wants his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Another issue I'd like to explore with you, Dr. Yala, because you've, as you say, you brought yourself. <laughs> By the way, my you know, good friend, mentor, Apostle Pukunina, was telling, he went to Korea, you know, not too long ago, and he was, he, he was asked by the Koreans, he said, we hear, you hear, you have a lot of Christians in, in Africa, that you have so many, so many Christians in Africa. He said, yes. Then they asked him, so why are you guys still poor? Listen, when we talk about for that work ethic, because work ethic, we talk about the Puritan work ethic, the people who built America, for example, is because these were Christians understood that whatsoever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for man. When we talk about people who work the hardest in Ghana, it should not be anybody but Christians. So that has really, really, really taken us back. This secular secret, that, that, what is the divide? There are divides. It's what is holy and unholy. What is good and what is evil, but not what is secular and what is sacred. I would like to explore another point about... You got me preaching. I'm, I'm very comfortable. <laughs> if you are fine, I'm fine. Because the, the, the people who listen to us want answers. Mm. The injury is about the things that do not get a chance to hear mm. anywhere else. Mm. One of the things that has humbled me on this program, and I can say to you without any equivocation, mm. is to find out that the people that you see doing their regular stuff in broadcasting, in entertainment, in theater. I hosted somebody who said, listen, I got the chance, Ajit mm, mm. and that, day, that was by far the slide that got, mm. that got the highest mm. feedback. Mm. He says, at the time when he needed money the most, mm. he got an endorsement deal from a company that dealt in alcohol. Mm. He looked at himself, his personal values, and said mm. he would not do it because as a youth facilitator, he couldn't see mm. how he would explain to his young people that mm. that was all right. It's just that he did it for business. And he mm. says he made a personal decision along with some counsel he received from some very good friends and okay. pastors not to do it. Okay. And he says he was happy that he made that decision mm. and much later, God affirmed his word in his life. But uh, the point I'm bringing home, really, mm. Dr. Yao, is that I found out that you see people doing their stuff, acting films. Sometimes they film me looking really, really, and people are mm. uh, hosting programs, entertainment, mm. and so on. But some of those people brought to me the most significant spiritual experiences, mm. personal encounters with God mm. and mm. what He had done in their lives. Yes. And I've come to the point where I'm asking myself, mm. do we rush to judge who is spiritual, who yes, knows right. God, Absolutely. and who does not know God because of a certain church they attend, or, or how they look outwardly, or because we know they hold a certain position, and preclude people that we think are not spiritual, or who probably know God even more than us? Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Um, and by the way, the alcohol thing you mentioned is very interesting because if you go to Europe, uh, some of the best alcohol is actually made by the monasteries. Really? Yes, like beer. I've, you know, in Czech Republic, I've been there and because again, a lot of it is also cultural. So there's also a cultural angle to it. You know, getting drunk is different from drinking. And the Bible talks about wine making you glad and things like that. So it's, it's more nuanced than the way we want to do it. And, and, and we have a way of classifying things to make life easy for us. You know, so, okay, this is secret. This is mean, we are senior. But what, Hakuna Matata, is that gospel song? Or is it we are senior? You know what I'm saying? There are some things that are just human. You know, and some of many of us in Ghana, we have lost our humanness. We are spiritual beings floating, and you know what? What does it mean to be human? We've even lost it. Let's look through the Bible and see how many people were as awful. Let, let's take, take your favorite Bible character, Abraham, entrepreneur, businessman. But look at Abraham's walk with God. <laughs> look at Abraham's walk with God. Who do you want to choose? Give me your, your favorite Bible character, David. He was a king. He was in politics. He was a he was in government. But you can't beat David when it comes to worship. But he was a he was a politician. He was a king. He was a soldier. He was a general. He, you know. So we have made our spirituality some way, and it's not landing. And when those walls break, and I, Guinness, do you know that Guinness is was is, is from a Christian family? Talk to me. Guinness. The Guinness family is very well known around the world for being a very solid Christian family. You know how come? They actually created that kind of alcohol because people were drinking a certain kind of alcohol that was making them die in Europe. And they said, let's solve this problem. Can we provide something that is healthier? That is, yes, that's how Guinness, Guinness started. Yes. So we had better, you know, Nehemiah. Nehemiah will pray. He said, the gracious hand of God upon me. But basically, you know, he was serving in the king's court. He was an administrator. Of course, he worked with Ezra, right? So we need the Nehemiah, so we need the Ezra's. The Ezra was a teacher of the law. He was a priest, all right? But Nehemiah, he was doing his government business. You better check ourselves into a police station after this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that kind of, that kind of thing. Yes, you know, look, let's look through our scripture. Let's look through our scripture. Even Jesus himself did carpentry for 30 years. You know, so, Abed, I, I, don't, I didn't know this conversation was going to go this way, but I tell you, if we're able to break that secular, sacred divide, you won't recognize this country. This is Springboard, your virtual university, and the closing thoughts of Dr. Yao Pebi. If we are able to break that Christian or sacred, secular divide, we will not recognize this country. But see, I'm going to ground my, my points by you again and give you the chance to, to speak to somebody who's struggling and who says, Doc, just say something to me. Because every time I close this show, I ask myself, for somebody who's listening, who's saying, nothing seems to be working for me. Mm. How can we provide them with some ministry, some strength to go through? So I've added two more points to the eight points that I wrote on pivoting the new world of work hybrids, Africa season, mm. destiny, early pointers, interwoven threads, mm. and authentic leadership. Those were my first eight. Mm. I've added one more point on the secular, sacred divide is not biblical. Not, and you're seeing that in, Jesus is Lord of all or mm. not Lord at all. Absolutely. And you're seeing that the Lord is interested in the whole world from archaeology to zoology. Absolutely. And when the policeman or teacher or doctor understands that this is the work of the Lord, mm -hmm. the world will be a better place. Secular work is full-time service. And you give examples in the scriptures mm. of people like Abraham and so on that mm. we thought people see them as ministers and you're seeing that these are secular Thank people you. who serve the Lord. You, you know the book of Esther doesn't mention God? Yes. But God is in every page. Every page, every verse. Every verse. And the final one is Christian work ethic. And you are saying that if Christians took the understanding of God into their work, hmm. the world will be a far better place. Absolutely. That's why it's been a beautiful, beautiful experience hanging out with you. And I wish you the best with Pebby Cups as you, you expand the frontiers because 
we didn't get a chance to talk about literary mm. knowledge and, I'll and, be back. And, 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 <laughs> and how much that will transform yes, the continent. Absolutely. And let me give you a minute on that because I'm mm. very big on, on that. Mm. I mean, I know we'll do this again, but please, yeah. just before you sign off, why is this literary thing so big for oh, you? There, for is, and there is so much researched wisdom that there's a direct correlation between literacy and economic prosperity. In fact, research shows that a person's literacy ability is a more, it's a predictor of their socio-economic future than their parents' socioeconomic status. Mm. So there can be a whole new generation, although the guy's parents are living in a kiosk. I know that one. The cause the child learned to read and explore the world that is available through literacy, they will end up totally somewhere different than where their parents are coming from. So we have a vision to see every African family successful as a result of this new culture of reading. I wish you the best as you push this, this Pebby Cups vision and we look forward to supporting it in Thank any you. way we can because it's a big vision that we are very interested in and mm. believing mm. that you are driving yourself in annually and I would love to hear and to the, the seven Cups. member clan. Yes. We are waiting for the last three and they will sign off together. Hey! The Lord be our helper. The Lord be our helper. But that means I have three to go. You have seven to no, go. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm, I'm I retired. <laughs> Doc, look into the camera and speak to somebody who's so lost at this time and saying, Lord, just help me. Mm. Mm. And this has been a very upbeat time together. That doesn't mean there are no scars to show difficulties in life. I told you about my birth. I haven't told you that I failed my final exam in medical school uh, in surgery. I had to do it again six months later. Um, I know how it is like to not have a regular income, you know, when I left medicine, you know, to pursue what I pursue, all kinds of situations. I know how it is like to have a loved one pass away. Uh, so whatever you're going through, I want you to know that it's only for a season. It's only for a season. But secondly, no matter what we go through, the best gift we can give ourselves is the ability to, and don't forget this word, is the ability to reframe. Reframe. So when I failed my exam, guess what? I took that opportunity to take a rest in South Africa, and while I was there, I wrote, I think, five new books. When I had an accident in Cote d'Ivoire and two of my colleagues lost their life, I looked at this and said, wow, God has spared me. I'm going to spend the rest of my life preaching the gospel and raising leaders, and I have in, I affect probably 150 countries. Do you understand what I'm saying? The ability to reframe. Tell God today that show me how to take this painful experience and make it a springboard for a fruitful future. Starbucks is what it is today because of the pain of Howard Schultz. You know, seeing his father suffer because he did not, they did not have good medical insurance for their workers. I could go through a lot of companies, a lot of successful people. It's because they picked the pain and reframed it for profit. Pick the pain and reframe it for profit. What an amazing end to this conversation. A big thank you to you, Dr. Yopebi. It's a pleasure. I love that. Thanks. Pick the pain <laughs> and reframe it for profit. I'll yes. write it somewhere on my wall. <laughs> Pick you. the pain. Remember to acknowledge me. And reframe it for yeah. profit. <laughs> Dr. Yopebi. I'll write on my wall. <laughs> this has been another, another inspiring, challenging, thought-provoking mm. edition of the Engine Room here on Springboard your virtual university. I can tell you have achieved our aim because Dr. Fabi has said some things here that I know he has not said anywhere else in the world. And I know the debate will always center on some parts, be that he said, and I love that. I love that so much. Let's have this conversation going, especially about the secular spiritual divide that we have created. And I'm sure that out of this, we will all become better people. A big thank you to MTN Pulse, the Enterprise Group, UMB Bank, the Multimedia Group, and the Graphic Business. And thanks, Dr. Yao. It's a pleasure. For making time. Warm regards to Anjali. Yes, thank you. So we come your way again next week. My name is Albert Okran, representing Team Springboard 
and saying God bless you, God bless you, and God bless you. Good.